Okay. So uh, do people still have five minutes each to speak? Um, yeah. That's not okay. Just, minutes, just, just, just shorten no, your. Don't speak for five minutes. Yeah. No, I'm not a panelist. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can I please ask you all to take your seats? Silence in the auditorium, please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've already got off to a very exciting start, and it's my pleasure to welcome you um, to this morning's plenary session on Building African Leaders. Uh, my name is Simu Kai. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Oxford, um, and I have the honor of introducing our moderator uh, for this session. Um, he is Dalamuzi Mashlanga, um, a star pupil from humble origins in Bulawayo and Zimbabwe, who has since gone on to study at both Harvard and Oxford and is currently a thriving youth leader working in mobile technology in Zimbabwe. Uh, he's also a good friend and a former classmate of mine. Um, so I'll be handing over to Dalamuzi, who will introduce the session and the speakers and will be moderating our discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your kind introduction. We have these running battles around whether, you know, Bulawayo is better than Harare or the other way around, but um, that really shouldn't be up for debate. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, really glad to have you all here. Uh, quite excited for the discussion that uh, we're going to have today. Um, and my general orientation when it comes to these discussions is that it's not really about um, the panelists, well, it kind of is because they will talk, um, but then it's about what the kinds of questions that we will generate, um, the kind of thinking that <clears throat> will get going um, amongst us and, you know, the takeaways that we will have um, getting out of this room and what we can actually do about, about this, this thing. So I'll just start off by posing three questions which I think will be important um, for panelists to at least um, consider and, and tackle with and for all of us to, to think about. Um, the first is, what is at stake? Why are we having this discussion in the first place? Um, the second is, what does leadership mean in this context? You know, what does it actually mean to be building young um, African leaders at this time in history? And the third is, what can and should we do um, about what we're going to discuss today? The first round was at stake. You know, the statistics, uh, we, we we're all probably quite familiar with them. You know, conversations around the youth bulge, uh, median age of 19, 65% of the African uh, sort of population below the age of 25, 10 million young people entering the workforce every year and confronted with very high unemployment rates all across the continent. And this is what's out there and that's important for us to grapple with. But then there are also very interesting trends. You have roads must fall, fees must fall, etc. And are those signs of leadership? Is this you know, young people who have been sleeping giants finally waking up um, to grapple with some of the serious questions in academia, um, etc.? But also, what's at stake in this room? Um, you know, the panelists are confronted or faced with a very critical and discerning audience. How do we make sure that in the very little time that we have, we actually discuss the very important issues um, and, and, and make the most of, of this time? The second question around what does leadership mean? Um, you know, we have people here interested in business, who are embedded in their communities, um, who think politically, and talking about that, you know, leadership means different things to different people. And I'll be curious to hear what, how you speak to those different people. And as I was coming here uh, reading the description of this, I was like, welcome back to Oxford. Because there was, you know, dystopian vision and gerontocracy, I, I missed that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, as you think about leadership, there's that audience to speak to. But then there's also the people in business who think of leadership in terms of investments, you know, really making the most building infrastructure, etc. So how do you speak to all of these audiences and really think about leadership um, in, in as comprehensive a way as possible? And then the last thing is what can and should we do? 
Um, we are in the Oxford Union right now. We are in Oxford. We are positioned in a particular way. We are, to some degree, most of us, an intellectual elite, an economic elite. Um, what can and should we do? What can and should we not do? Um, what, what are our blind spots? Um, and, and how do they shape uh, the actions that we take going on from here? So I thought those were three important questions to think about. I hope you can speak to them um, in some measure. Um, that will make me very happy. Um, so, yeah. Um, we'll start off with uh, Parminder. Parminder, yes, of course. Why not? Why not start with the young African yeah. leaders? No, one. Not... And not the old. I was going, I was, I've got into trouble with going with old and wise, etc. Oh, okay. I won't go there. Um, but we'll start off with, uh, with Parminder, who heads the Ten Tony Elumelu Foundation. Yeah. Uh, and she, you know, doing phenomenal work, committed $100 million over the next 10 years to build um, entrepreneurs across the continent. And then we'll have Judy uh, share with us. She's the director, program director of the Mandela Rhodes uh, Foundation. Yeah. And that's a very, Mandela Rhodes. Two interesting, dare I say, leaders. Uh, Antonio from Antonio. <laughs> Antonio. <laughs> yes, uh, from uh, from from different generations, and you know how those legacies come come together. And uh, we will um, have Kopo Mapila share with us his insights about you know policy making, his experience there, because really policy to some degree sets the conditions that enable or do not enable leadership. So in that order, thank you. Please. Thank you. So thank you, Oxford. Um, and you know, really, um, greetings from Nigeria, from Lagos, which is where I've just flown in from. Um, Africa is waiting. Africa is rising. Africa is on the move. I moved there literally two years ago, um, abandoning my daughter here in Oxford, um, because it was a mission call, a call, and you know, the universe conspired to bring Mr. Alimalu, Tony Alimalu, a businessman and a phenomenal visionary I'd never met, though I'd heard about his philosophy of African capitalism, institutionalizing luck, his passion for Africa, because Africa is what made him, and his passion to reinvest um, in Africa. So the, his challenge to me was, I have a vision to invest in 10,000 Pan-African entrepreneurs, that's 54 African countries. I did pause and say, don't you think Nigeria is big enough? And he said, no, 54 African countries over the next 10 years, and I'm committing $100 million. And, I would, and would I come and help him operationalize that vision? So I'm merely the facilitator. The vision, the credit, the energy, the passion, is, belongs to Mr. Lumalu and the Tony Lumalu Foundation, which was set up in 2010. I'm a storyteller. My background is 20, 30 years as a filmmaker, um, and which is what's taken me to Africa um, over and over again, working with its creative talent, storytellers, to bring a, a new narrative, a different a narrative, to tell stories from Africa from the inside. I've done that across Africa, Asia, Latin America. And because I'm a storyteller, we've also then documented our first um, entrepreneurial journey in launching and, and setting up the Tony Limulu Entrepreneurship Program, which, as you can imagine, was not uh, an easy feat. And I will talk about um, its um, structure and framework and the kind of solution um, that we've developed. So I want to share with you a two-minute clip because there's nothing, you know, a, a picture tells a, a, a thousand words and is much nicer to see and hear um, some of the Tony Illumidu entrepreneurs. So it's literally Africa two minutes. Africa is a land of opportunities. There's no better time than this moment to be and become an entrepreneur in Africa. I'm from Ghana. My business is in the IT sector. I'm the founder of Wix Fresh Foods, which is a company that aims to promote healthy lifestyle in Africa. I have committed 100 million US dollars to support the next generation of Africa entrepreneurs. The program represents a taking more commitment to support 10,000 African entrepreneurs and staff. I've been mentoring five main teams. People will be developing businesses and creating jobs, which is badly needed in Africa. When someone says, this is impossible, reply with two sentences. One, 
nothing is impossible. Two, impossible only takes long time. Your creativity, innovation, talent, the most important is strength of character is our future. I'm sure that your countries and our continent will be safe in your hands. Just focus on creating value. Because anytime you focus on creating value, you are attracting capital. I had a dream to connect with our African brothers and sisters and to have made this dream come true. And to me, it's like a legacy. Put yourself in my position and walking in my own age at 80, for instance, that I visit Zambia. And someone says, I own this financial institution. I got $10,000 from the setting man from Nigeria called to Nelimi. That's my ambition. Now we can um, come to Still we plan today through the 20 million entrepreneurship program to help to develop Africa in the future. Thank you. So really I don't have to say anything. <laughs> so you saw our, those were the 1,000 um, Tony Lumilu entrepreneurs that we gathered um, for three days of a TEEP boot camp in Lagos. If any of you have been to Africa, try flying from one country to another across Africa, but we managed to get all 1,000 of them. And within, it's a 12-week it's a, it's a program. So what are we doing? We are, through this program, building the future business leaders, and I want to really focus my um, contribution to business leaders and, and the entrepreneurial class that every, all the 54 African economies need in order to, um, in order to, uh, to, be, to become economically viable and, and grow and sustain the growth that many of those, um, those countries are already achieving. Many of these entrepreneurs will work in the supply chain, both for, for the government as well as within, within the private sector. It's about building the local, a pan-African um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. So it is, you know, it's the, these are the leaders that we are investing in. It's an investment who's going to bring prosperity and economic independence across Africa. Africa has had political independence. It has been through the three generations of the political, um, the, the military rules, the, you know, the, the, you know the, those, those leaders who've been in power for the last 20, 30 years. But it is you, this generation, Generation Ford, that is really going to build, bring that prosperity. And, eco and it's an economic, you know, what Africa is, is, what I'm seeing in Africa in the last two years is the strive for economic independence. And it is the private sector business leaders um, and, 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 and the entrepreneurial class who are going to lead that economic development. And what we are doing is empowering that entrepreneurial class to power the African economies. Our entrepreneurs are not social workers. Um, they are not the solution to every problem. What they do have are eyes where they see gaps in the marketplace and gaps that require that they can then bring solutions um, and entrepreneurial solutions. They are not only thinking out of the box, often they're inventing a new box. We, through the entrepreneurship program, are building an investable pipeline. They tell me that there's no shortage of capital across Africa, and I totally agree with that as an entrepreneur. But what is lacking is the entrepreneurial class that is an investable opportunity. So over the next decade, we're building an investable pipeline so that, at that um, many of the African economies and countries can move from import to import substitution and to export. The amount of goods that are dumped onto the African markets is unbelievable. We were, in we were in a meeting with the president of Uganda who said his country contributes $800 million to the Chinese economy, $1,900 million to my country's, um, the Indian economy, 
through imports. Imagine if, the, the, if, if, if a lot of what um, is being imported and, and the money that's going out, and education and health sectors are two of the biggest imports out of Africa. Imagine if, there was some, if that capital flight could remain, and our entrepreneurs are going to be the solution providers of how they can reverse that. Identifying the gap and developing made in Africa by Africans for Africa products and services, that is what the Tony Lumulu Entrepreneurship Program is doing. Just in terms of the formula, you know, Americans, you know, we have, and, and, oh, okay, sorry, time. But we, no, know, we can come back to it. <laughs> no, but just in terms of what is the formula for the Tony Lumulu Entrepreneurship Program, I guess, um, you know, they're just doing two things. One is that it's institutionalizing luck. Mr. Lumulu believes, you know, I mean, a lot of people said that he was lucky when he was 26 years old and he was made a branch manager, and he's never looked back to a bank that he is now the chairman of the, the United Bank of Africa. He could have remained in Nigeria with UBA, but he chose um, to take it Pan-Africa, and now has 19, 19 um, um, UBAs in 19 countries. So it's about institutionalizing that, but more importantly, it's about providing tools with which entrepreneurs can succeed. Um, and those tools for us are really the seven pillars of T. It's training. Our entrepreneurs, and there is an entrepreneur from the Tony Illumilu Entrepreneurship Program in the audience. There he is. And you can talk to them directly as to what it was their takeaway. They tell me that it was the training that they received over the 12 weeks. It's the mentoring. We have nine, 780 mentors from worldwide who are supporting our 1,000 entrepreneurs. It's the networks. I mean, those guys networked online, and then they met physically. And it is the seed capital. We are providing two rounds of seed capital, um, $5,000 proof of concept. We don't want that $5,000 back. And another $5,000 as a, a convertible note, not because we want to take lots of equity in other people's businesses, but because we want to teach our entrepreneurs how to get themselves investor ready so that when they go to a private equity or a venture capital or any other third party investor, they know how to present themselves. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Judy. Thank you. Well, perhaps before I speak about the work of the foundation, I'll probably answer the, the pertinent question that the moderator put around this very oxymoronic Mandela Rhodes combination. So a bit of the history is that in the late 90s, when the Rhodes Trust was looking at celebrating its 100th year anniversary in 2003, there were several parties of, uh, I think, Rhodes scholars, particularly in the Southern African region, who were asking the Trust, well, what do you think you're going to do in this 100th year celebration? And perhaps to start looking at bringing back some of the wealth from its origins, because I think a lot of you will know that that's who Rhodes made most of his money in Southern Africa. And so after various iterations, uh, the decision was taken to say, well, we should partner with someone on the African continent who perhaps represents a new hope for the future. And of course, at that time, it was none other than Nelson Mandela himself. So I think it's very important, particularly with the current debates happening, that people understand that a lot of Madiba's close advisors actually said, Madiba, no, 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 you can't put your name next to Cecil John Rhodes. This, it, our history, the context of South Africa, the imperialist, it's absolutely unacceptable. You can't do it. So Madiba, being who he is in his own wisdom, some people call it madness, asked himself a couple of questions and he said, great. So if we create this foundation, will it actually close the circle of history if you consider the context of South Africa and particularly his own reconciliation agenda at the time, which is to say, how do we find a way as South Africans to build together for the future, given the very unjust society and the past that we did uh, suffer as a country? So for him, the combination of his name with Cecil John Rhodes fitted quite well with his broader reconciliation agenda of saying, how do we take the past in all its imperfections and harness it to benefit the present and the future? And then the second question he asked himself was, Will this money actually benefit young Africans in Africa and will this foundation be run and led by Africans? And he said, fantastic, well, then I don't see what the problem is. Let's go out there, let's find the next generation of young leaders on the continent, let's build them, let's develop them, and let's instill in them the kind of principles and values that will ensure that we look at the next generation of leaders being ethical uh, young leaders. So 
For us, then, as a foundation, when we were formed in 2003, our task was to go and build the next generation of young leaders. And I think probably quite important to the broader debates that you, you speak to as well that are currently happening in South Africa. One of the key questions the trustees asked Madiba in the beginning was to say, but Madiba, again, given the history of South Africa, should we not have a kind of a quota system or are you looking for this to just be for black uh, young leaders? And again, Madiba put out a challenge to us and he said, well, if you're selecting all white men in this program, then you haven't looked enough. Because I believe there is the exact talent on this continent that could be representative of the young leaders from across the different genders, races, diversities, etc. So when we look at our program now, and our, primarily the work that we do is through our scholarship program, so we find any person who comes from any of the countries on the continent who's interested in pursuing postgraduate studies in South Africa, and we provide full funding for them. And really, I think if you read some of our founding documents around what we're trying to build and who we're looking for, the kind of young African leader who's sitting there and says, enough is enough. I can't keep sitting in my country and watching the way that leaders are, are using the positions of influence and power, and power and actually I am wanting to use my skills for the better. So there's a document called Characteristic Sorting of Mandela Road Scholar and it's really the call and you know when you read the document part of it says young African aspire to be a Mandela Road Scholar if you dream of being a leader. A leader in whose blend of character and intellect Africa can take pride. Aspire to this if you believe you have within you the moral force of character to lead and understand that leadership is not just about personal ambition, it is also about service for the benefit of others. And as you continue to read it, you understand then that the kind of person that we're looking for is one who will really understand the grappling with the past legacies in our continent, because I think when you have the scholars come together for our leadership programs, you get to hear the most fascinating debates. I mean, exactly the questions you're asking about in terms of roads, etc. You have a student maybe coming from Nigeria going, what you guys going on about? White people this, white people that, because of course for South Africa, our kind of big national wound is the race thing, because that was what apartheid and how it discriminated against. And they say, well for us, mate, it's a tribal thing. So it's black on black, you know, for us it's a religious thing. And so to begin to start to understand what are the different dynamics that are happening across the continent and to equip our scholars with understanding the complexities uh, of what's happening. And also to actually find the inspirations and the possibilities that exist, because I think, as you rightfully said, we are the privileged. We sitting here are the privileged. And what does it mean to really start to understand the privilege and the responsibility we have, but to use that? And I think a lot of times people kind of look at Africa and, you know, there's a sad sorry story about us, but actually there's a lot of hope. When I look at the 325 students that we've selected so far, who come from 23 different African countries, from <coughs> Egypt to Ghana to Nigeria to, the, to Gabon, Kenya, all over the continent, I get goosebumps, I, you know, I'm always learning, I'm always stretched, I'm always stimulated, and already our scholars, we are seeing them uh, in various components of, uh, of the different sectors, actually starting their own initiatives. We've got one of our scholars, Kim Smith, who is instrumental in this menstrual cup that's, uh, you know, as you know, a lot of uh, girls across the continent struggle with issues of menstrual pain and they don't, go, they don't go to school because they don't have the resources for that. So it's things like that. One of our, our scholars is also instrumental in, in some of the water resourcing issues in South Africa. We've got Nobulali Dagazela, who has started a theater company and using theater as a tool for education. So for us, 13 years in, we're already starting to see the fruits of the work that we've been doing. And I think the essence of it is to continue to create these spaces, grow the scholarship program, create these leadership initiatives, and to continue to take our students to these very contentious historical sites where they go and visit Cecil John Rhodes' house, they go and visit Mandela's house, they go to different historical sites, and they debate and engage. And I mean, it's absolutely fascinating just to be there. And it, I think it inspires us because when we understand that, our scholars are asking themselves the question of what's our responsibility as Mandela Rhodes scholars to both I guess help people who are maybe quite angry about the past and rightfully so, but also say how do we recognize that and try to build for the future. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. Amazing. Thank you. So um, I'm not from a foundation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually a student here. I'm a student of public policy at the School of Government. And um, 
why I am interested in the whole topic of building young African leaders is because I've got a couple of questions which were posed at the beginning of the panel that I've been grappling with. Um, things like how leadership has been understood in Africa for the longest time um, and what that understanding of leadership actually means and what it means for us young people going forward given all the statistics about um, youth in Africa and the fact that not only is it a very young continent, in the next couple of years a billion people will be born and it's going to be even younger. So these are the kind of things the, um, that have been playing in my mind. And um, I think Judy mentions it, and it's a very important point, is that when you think about leadership on the continent, it is impossible to think about it in the absence of um, our history. The colonial history um, and in South Africa apartheid, Africa for many parts and for, um, in many ways is defined by our colonial legacy. And given that, and because of that definition, leadership on the continent is seen primarily through a political lens. Um, it's changing now as the Tony Lemulu Foundation and other foundations move towards um, business leadership, but for the most part it's seen through a political lens. And then what does, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for me and many people in the audience as a young African, given the fact that our political leaders are many, many, many years older than us? The political leaders, are, the average political leader, as it was spoken in the last session, is 65 years old, and um, the average African is about 25 years old. There's a, there's a, there's a huge generational divide there. And given the, the history that we have, political leaders were, the, the, the current political leaders were made through fighting institutions that were created to oppress us. Um, in South Africa, from um, the ANC and ruling parties, Nelson Mandela, they were forged through fighting institutions that were made to oppress us. But now, as young Africans, we live in a society where the institutions that we interact with are meant to help us develop as people. And so what does that mean? And I think the biggest question and the toughest question is probably what leadership means in an authentically African sense. Um, and at, the, at the, very, the very first principles of leadership, because the way we see leadership and the way leadership is spoken about can somewhat be seen as um, a very Western ideal of leadership. Um, in the East, we have the service conception Confucian style of leadership. We have a very service-led leadership. But in Africa, our, our identity of leadership is something that we as Africans, we as young Africans need to ask ourselves what that actually means. Um, that's where we need to look back at fundamental principles from around the continent, principles such as Ubuntu, principles where the community is a moral actor and the village is the, is the moral individual as opposed to the individual themselves. And I think in that way, we can take our continent forward in a way that doesn't have the baggage of history. It uses history to reinforce where we're going forward. And that's kind of what I want to grapple with and discuss and hopefully come out of the session with some answers. Great. Like Great. Um, before we open it up to the floor, um, one question that I have, and all of you can answer, one of you can answer, two of you, and I think those are all the options we have. Um, <laughs> there's, I mean, there's a lot that's been said about history, structures, institutionalizing luck, etc. It's a simple question. What's standing in the way of these visions that we have for building young African leaders? Like, what are we up against, as it were? I mean, I think, I think we're up against many things. I think, um, on one hand, young African leaders are up against old African leaders. Um, on the other hand, um, no, and, I, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying this in a very, um, I'm, I'm saying this in quite, in quite a serious way in that um, it's very difficult when there is a, about a 40-year difference between the, the rulers and the ruled. It's very, dif it's very difficult to have those difficult conversations. Um, in, in many ways, space is not created for young African leaders, and young African leaders are forged out of creating their own spaces. So if you look at um, the Fees Must Fall protest, for example, young African leaders rose up against the fact that they could not afford the school fees. Um, they were not given, they, they actually stood up against something that was put in place to deny them a space. And so I think 
on the one hand, it's the, the generational divide. On the other hand, it's just the fact that the facilitation of these conversations is seen in, in quite myopic ways, in quite um, one-dimensional ways. And we need to be more nuanced about what we mean to be a leader and what, what the questions are. Um, so it's quite, a, it's quite a complex, I think it's quite a complex dynamic, especially because we are trying to create a space for young African leaders, but the space in which we're trying to create is still contested. Yeah, maybe good. if I can come in there. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a very, very important point, this kind of um, generational gap component, because I do think, uh, particularly in South Africa, for example, 67% of the population is under the age of 35. Um, and if you kind of look at the political realm, the two top opposition parties are both leaders who are 35, 36. So it's a very kind of interesting question and dynamic around, uh, you know, how, who are you appealing to? What are you trying to offer your citizens? Who are your citizens? How do you understand your citizens? I think probably from a political perspective. But I do also see uh, a lot of what some of our students tell us is, Maybe it's an African cultural thing, but it's like, hey, hey, hey when you're a child, you don't sit at the table, yeah. you know? Yeah. So there's also this dynamic of, as youngsters, you know, if you have a view, so, I mean, you go to a youth uh, pa panel, and it's like, everyone there's 50 talking about yeah. Like, but where are the young people? Where, where are the young people to talk about young people issues? So I think it's also perhaps, the, the viewpoint and the perception around you know, youth and what role young leaders play, and is it kind of just a, a conciliatory prize to say, yeah, let's have the token young person in there, or is it actually being able to look at the nature of the continent and to say, you know, if, if we're look, working in a democratic space and democracy is majority, look at this, the majority of our people, these are our constituencies, so how do we bring in young people, not as future leaders, but as current leaders right now, because as you've heard in, in the panel so far, young people are leading in their spaces right now, are actually challenging the systems right now, and so I think there's a mind shift change that needs to happen around not thinking about young people as people of the future, but people of the now. I mean, you know, it's not all despair, guys. Um, you know, I, you know, I mean, there, there's not a tablet which says, you know, this is what constitutes good leaders, and you know, those, these are, you know, these are questions we have to address while being on the move, right? It's not like we're going to sit here and find the answer. I just want to share a couple of things. I mean, we took 30 of our entrepreneurs. I held a meeting with 100 of them in Uganda on Monday, last Monday. And, and, and an, another meeting in Rwanda as well. And we selected 30 because the president's room only could accommodate 30. Anyway, we selected 30 and we took them to meet um, the president. And they were gonna do three things. One was to pitch their business, an elevator pitch to tell the president, this is what I'm we're doing, this is my business. Um, secondly, what is it the president could do for them as, on, as entrepreneurs and making, doing ease of business and so that they can exercise their leadership because to be an entrepreneur is to be your own leader. You're not looking for permission for someone else to say, you know, lead or you're not looking for anything. You're, you are providing your own leadership. So they wanted to tell him, you know, how the president could uh, make it, you know, it really remove some of the barriers and obstacles that he had the power to do. And the third was really for them to say, look, dear president, you have a lot on your plate. Here, you know, what is it that we as entrepreneurs, as the, entrep you know, the new business leaders, the new class of entrepreneurs in Uganda can do for you? And what really blew him away, and even the, the amazing you know, business leader, Tony Alumalu, who was sitting there, was how articulate and how clear they were when they stood up and spoke to the president. There was no servitude. They were not being subservient. They were not kowtowing. And these are 21 to about 28, 30-year-old entrepreneurs, never been anywhere near the president, yeah? But when they stood up, it wasn't like, you know, we're asking for your permission. We are the leaders, they were saying. We're running businesses, we're finding solutions. Actually, President, you need us more than we need you. Right. Not for votes, but you need us because you have, your, the, you, know, you have an ambitious program for the economic development of Uganda. And I see this everywhere. One of the beautiful things about running this program is that it's online, but then we have used our convening power 
to bring, bridge that generational gap, right? So we've taken our entrepreneurs to meet the president of Senegal from Mali. We're going to Zambia on, on Tuesday. We did the same in Rwanda. We did it in South Africa, wherever in the 51 African countries. So we are empowering our young leaders, business leaders, um, you know, to, to, we're empowering them to not only grow their own businesses, create jobs, create wealth, but also have the confidence to be able to take on precisely those institutions that get in their way. And it is that collective power that is going to change, is that mass movement. We will now link our entrepreneurs with the Mandela Foundation, with the Yali um, program coming out of America. I mean, there are many, many programs, but the important thing is that it's the individual that's empowered, and that individual is then part of the massive collective movement. Great. So we'll open Does that it up. Sense? Yeah, but <laughs> before we do this, there's, there's a question that I have, which I hope you can keep at the back of your mind as you answer questions. Is what's new about this question? Because you know there was mention of um, the gap, etc. There's always been a gap. Like you know, I'm sure when my president Mugabe um, <laughs> was growing up, you know, there was probably like you know some older guy yeah. there you know, standing in his way. Um, so you know, these are some some of these questions we've had for for a long time, but then what are the new elements about this question in this particular time in history that we really need to be, to be thinking about? What makes this question different when we are asking it in 2016 as opposed to if it was asked in 1965? You know? I can be controversial if you want. Well, I mean, so all these guys you're talking about, the Mandela's mm -hmm. and, and the Museveni's and Mugabe's, etc. They were the liberators. You know, they were the guys who were going to deliver us from the evil people and you know take us into freedom. Now the now the challenge is they go into power and then they stay. So that's what's changed in the past 30 years is that they these people who were once the people that nations looked up to, aspired to, have now become the people who are holding on to power, wanting to change constitutions so they can have extra terms. And I think that's why probably this conversation is, is pertinent now because you're looking and you're saying, well, it's 30 years later and these people are still in charge. And mm -hmm. is it really the will of the people or is it through some shenanigans that they're still there? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a view. Cool. Great. Questions? The audience. Yeah. We have a roving mic, right? Yes? Okay. So you have the power. It's up to you. Just, yeah. Okay, that's what we the last Okay. Sure, we'll take three at a time. So hi, thank you so much for your thought and your sh sharing experiences. I have a question and it is a little bit related to the last one you asked, but mine is not what makes this debate different, but is it really different? For instance, what I'm saying is generation of my fathers, I'm from Senegal, and they were thinking that they were going to be the generation that was that were going to make the change. And the new narrative we are talking about, Africa is changing, African leaders, young African leaders are making a change, they were also saying that at that time. So is it really a generation gap, or is it like, as history is going, each time young leaders or young people think that they are going to make history, while history is just making and it's a continuation. So how is it that we are not able to connect ourselves to what happened before, that we are not interested to know what did they do? How did they do it? If it works, why we, maybe we don't need to make it different. We just need to make it, uh, to try to adapt it to our situation and to try to see also what did they do? How did they do it? If it was wrong or if it didn't work, why did did not work? And if it's have also to something worked in what they did, how can we take it and how can we make it better? Instead of seeing ourselves as a kind of rupture to, to this generation. Thank you. Cool. Sorry, I didn't want to. Uh, I thought there were a few people uh, ahead of me. David Johnson. Uh, so I just wonder if the panel might answer um, the question: Is is there really is it really a question of the question of leadership or? the question for leadership and just to punctuate that i mean the the you know it, it is a, an idea about 
moral leadership, not only political leadership or business leadership. Morality, in my view, doesn't age. Uh, I speak as a former leader of um, a student movement in South Africa and one that fought with the ANC in the camps of Angola and elsewhere uh, to a sedate academic at, um, at Oxford. Uh, the idea of leadership has always been one that has been driven by the youth, Z.K. Matthews, the leadership of the South African Communist Party. Uh, the ANC was formed as an organization in, in, in 1912, but it was quite, it was quite flat. I won't go into the history of all of this, but I think there is a really dangerous um, development, as it were, uh, in the debate about leadership space. I think the question about the moral compass for leadership, and importantly, the idea of the national question. Uh, in the absence of what seems to be a national question elsewhere, uh, I think the question about what is leadership is in disarray. So, yeah. Cool, third question we'll have from Thanks a lot, it's been fascinating. I have a question though, or rather a concern. Every time we talk about young leadership in Africa, we talk about business and political leadership. And I wonder why is it that we don't talk about academic leadership? We don't talk about academic excellence. We don't talk about the thoughts and the resources and the research that funds and advises business and politics. We talk about all business leaders get their information about Africa from Harvard and Oxford. Um, same thing with politics. They get their research about what's going on in Kenya from Oxford. And I wonder why is it that we are not using the resources in our countries to be able to fund and talk about and have the same craze about academic excellence and academic leadership, especially among young people. Who's feeling, who's being moved by the spirit? I think, um, I'll, start with the, I'll start with the first question, um, thank you, about what is the difference between these conversations? These conversations were had by our parents, their parents, and now us. Um, the way I see it, it's the conversations may be the same in many regards, but the drivers of the conversations are different. Before, in the generation of our parents, we're speaking about political liberation and political rights, and today the conversation has moved much more to economic freedom, economic rights, economic liberation, um, socioeconomic development, and so while the conversation may sound similar, like what is leadership, why do we need leadership, the reasons for leadership are completely different, I think, and the forms in which leadership take. And I think that leads me to the other question about what is leadership, and it's a moral question, and, um, and morality doesn't age regardless of which context you look at it through. And it's a very difficult question to answer because then I ask, you know, what, what is morality and who do, whose form of morality do we understand and do we take as young Africans and as Africans? Do we, because, you know, the, the notions of morality um, or African moral positions have kind of been pushed aside. Pushed aside in the way that you just mentioned in the, in the third question that um, why is it that we have our conceptions and leadership and everything coming from outside and not being brought and grown back home. And so, how we develop our own moral compass for, for um, leadership is a very, it's, it's, a, it's a very inter, inward looking question that we need to sit down as young Africans and have the conversation. I don't think we can get there unless we're having the very difficult conversations. Sure. Perhaps if I come in, I think it's always a, a, a balancing act around this idea of what's ours and what's homegrown and what's, what do we learn from a globalized world. Because I think, particularly for us, for example, when we look at um, how we define re reconciliation, so for us it's about human rights, justice, equality for all, right? Which is quite a, a, a global um, set of definitions. But then in part of the discussions that we have in our leadership program with our scholars, some people may say, well, it's immoral for me that South Africa has allowed gay people to get married. 
right? So now this is a human rights question. And so you ask this question of, well, what is your responsibility as a leader? Is it about advancing human rights for all so that no citizen is, dis is, is disadvantaged because of who they are? But then also, what is my own personal perspective as a leader around what I think is moral? And I think those are some of the debates which some people may say homosexuality is un-African and others will challenge that. So this, this question of what is ours, what is homegrown, what is Western, what is not, must be, I think, cuffed around the question of human rights and whether or not we are oppressing people in any way. And I think um, it's very important when we talk about leaders that we aren't just thinking about business and politics. And I think it's always the kind of default place that we go to because that's kind of the, the easy things that we look at. But for us, particularly at the foundation, we actually fund across the different sectors and we've got some of our scholars who are doing amazing work in, in the media sector, some of our scholars who are actually challenging exactly what you're talking about around academia, where they are trying to create um, African research and saying, for example, in psychology, don't, you know, uh, someone may say, say in, in, in my home language, we are tagata, you know, or they would say we are twasa, which is, are you having a mental episode or is this you communing with the sangomas, you know? And so how does this research and, and the African way of looking at this stuff come through in your practice as a psychologist, for example? So there's a lot of work that I think some of our scholars are doing in trying to push the public discourse around some of the things that are quite African in, in their nature, but also challenging how this relates to how you practice as a, as a practitioner. So I think it is very important. It's not look at the narrow definition of leadership as just being business and politics, but it actually spans across the different sectors because what we want to do is build people who will go and be influential in their various sectors uh, and try and create um, a different way of thinking in their spaces. So that's my if there's any consolation, I mean, as I said, I moved to um, Nigeria in April 2014, and someone who's worked all her life in the UK, I don't think I attended or participated in many discussions around leadership. Yeah, around, you know, just having a debate. But in the last three years, I have had such an education on leadership. You know, it's a question that the business sector, women, politicians, the political, the young people, um, it's a question that they are constantly discussing, you know, how best to run my business. What kind of leadership should I be providing? I suddenly find myself in a position of leadership as the CEO of the foundation. That is not what I went to do. I went to structure the Tony Ling Liu Entrepreneurship Program. And I began to question myself as to, oh my God, do I have the skills? Do I have the tools to now lead? You know, we have a staff of 10. And what's amazing is that majority of them were educated either in Oxford or Bristol or you know, they were educated outside and they've chosen to come back home. And the, the younger, they're from the age of 22 year old is my youngest and, and to 20, 30 year old. So, you know, so Ms. Tony Illuminum constantly tells us, those of the senior, you know, we have a, an obligation now to train and groom these young, um, these young leaders who will go on to run the foundation who will go on to run the program, who will go on to do many of those things. Um, so I, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's much more, it's interesting to have that discussion inside Africa, sitting in a company or sitting in a foundation, um, than to sit in the ivory towers of Oxford Union um, and, and, and talk about it in an abstract sense, because, you know, then you, you have to deal with all the challenges of, 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 um, of I don't know, affecting good leadership, yeah? Um, when you are actually running a business, running a country, running whatever. And women are really amazing. I think African women, if you want to look for real in, you know, indigenous um, way, you know, around leadership discussion around leadership, I think we should look to African women. Great, thank you. I don't know. Um, <laughs> We will have one more round of quick questions and quick responses, very quick, because we need no to more. wrap up. But from this side of the room. Yeah. Hi, um, quick question. What are the key skills for that, that you think young people should have um, for the future in an African context? The world is changing quickly. Um, what would you pinpoint as the primary skills? 
key skills. Another second and a third, and then we wrap up from so we can have the Hi, so just, yeah, a couple of different comments, right? Um, what concerns me about this idea, you know, it's important, economic development is important. For a country like ours in South Africa, there was a time when our economy was, our economy was doing very, very well, but we saw inequality increased at the same time, do you know? So for me, it's quite dangerous to separate the economic from the sociological, considering our histories, you know? Next thing is the issue of youth programs and all of that. There's a number of them that are coming up all over the continent developing youth leadership, but unwittingly you reinforce some of the very same power dynamics, class dynamics going on, because a lot of these things, one, the application forms, who can access them, the language, who can access them. So what are we doing beyond developing this very same cohort of people? What are we doing to prepare the others so that one day they can also join in on the party? And then the third one, Kopo made a comment about, um, you know, this move away from the individual, you know, and I find that interesting in a discussion about leadership, because a lot of the time discussions about leadership are actually about taking the exceptional person and removing them from their community, rather than it being, you know, like the communal sense he was talking about. Yeah, goes. Hi. I think it's excellent that she just said that because that feeds kind of directly into what I was about to say. Making new entrepreneurs in the African economy, does it not just set the platform to repeat what we've seen here? Um, entrepreneurialism is not new, you know. Businesses are popping up all over the place. So we're in a business boom in the 21st century. So when these businesses are built, will not the same goals be to minimize expenses and increase profits? Will, not, will we not the same, uh, have the same fears that new big corporations around the place are going to delocalize production and send it to places where it's cheaper to do? That's going to hurt the same economy that we have here? I'm just thinking that we can build new businesses, but will they not have the same goals? Profit, is it going to be socially focused? And when I say socially focused, I don't just mean consumer focused. Everyone's going to need to get their customers in to make money. What is it going to do for the employees? Is it going to change? Uh, our business is going to help their employees and not just pay them and when uh, economies contract, they're going to lay people off. Is, is, is there going to be a repeat of what we've seen here? It's all good telling people that, hey, it's great, go and make businesses, go and earn more money, but people could be looking in, in, into entrepreneurship, into let's make new technology. They've seen the Facebooks, the Twitters, Instagram, they've seen the billions that have been made. I want to do that too. Are they going to say, right, in this, uh, because if you look at the UK, they're very service sector intensive, uh, probably about 80% service sector. And over in Africa, Nigeria and Ghana respectively, they have roughly near 50% uh, service sector and they're 50% primary sector as well. So should we build on that? Should we look at what we can do for people as opposed to what businesses can do for themselves? Because businesses are gonna do for themselves. They have to survive, that's the number one rule of business. And then their profit. So are we helping people or are we just helping businesses to help themselves? Yeah. Thank you. All right. So now we'll have quick responses. Emphasis on quick. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> so the first one was key skills. I'd say imagination. Be risk averse. Take risks. Be fearless. And passion. Um, and, 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 and have a fire in your belly. You know, apps don't plow the land, right? Um, they don't pick the tomatoes or the potatoes that you've grown, right? And so, what, you know, so the program that we designed was precisely that, which is not, which is really to create physical businesses, yeah? So this one Ugandan farmer, and I'll give a couple of examples, 35% of our, 36% of our entrepreneurs are in the agriculture space. They're not creating apps and mobile solutions for farmers. They are farmers. Um, and they're in cassava processing, they're in yam, they're in grain. They're looking at how to go, go from farm to fork. 
and they're across those supply chains. So I was amazed when we started to read the 20,000 applications we received in the first year and over 45,000 that it was agri, agri, agri businesses. And you know, so he, you know, so and this one Ugandan farmer that's been on our, that was on the program last year is now training 15 other farmers <coughs> in his community around um, underground irrigation, which will allow those those fa farmers to have three crops a year. Of I think he grows potatoes, tomatoes, and apples. Yeah. And that's just one, one example. There's another woman who said, I want to set up a motor mechanics workshop aimed at women. She now has, um, she's now, as a result of going, being in the program and the capital, she's able to now employ 20 people um, and 20 women and, and, and train women mechanics. So you know, I can give you, I'll give you a leaflet of the testimonies from the thousand entrepreneurs um, who are running physical businesses not from their garages either, which is where all American businesses start. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Great, thank you. Do you have sure. quick yeah, responses? I mean, yeah. just maybe to add to this, the, the, the key skills you raise, systems thinking, like understanding the system, because I think there's this illusion that people say, we're fighting the system. We are the system. Exactly. We are the system. So I think that's quite a critical skill. And I think linked to that is um, the idea of navigating complexities and then emotional intelligence. I mean, they always kind of talk about this soft, touchy, feely thing called EQ, but it's actually quite a critical leadership skill to be able to have both managing your own emotions and being able to understand where other people are. Because as a leader, that's how you, what you use and harness to actually help achieve what you want to do. And then briefly, I think responding to the very passionate and important point um, that my fellow South African sisters made there, are these programs not just elite programs reinforcing the same system? I think it's a very important challenge to put out to us, but I think you must recognize that there are multiple programs that are trying to uh, tackle the same prob uh, problem or the same question. And I think for us, the reality is there are a group of young African leaders that are going to go and be influential. So if we can get them while they're in their mid-20s, bring them together, help them to unpack the critical issues happening in the continent, help them to develop as leaders. And I mean, you, if you sit in the room and you'll see how some of our scholars leave the program having thought about things differently, having asked very critical questions of themselves, I would sign up to being part of that because at least I've influenced the kind of people that are going to be in these positions of influence in the future and the way that they show up, the kind of values and morals and principles and collaborative spirit and the way they can engage with the system, at least will feel like it's a bit different and better than them not having gone through the program. So I do agree with you that it's about recognizing the privilege of it, but what do you do with that space while also being very aware that there are other initiatives that are trying to do similar things to perhaps people who are working on the ground and to say, how do we work better collaboratively together? Thank you. Quickly. Um, the two key skills that I would suggest is curiosity and adaptability, because as long as you're curious about the continent and you're curious about different sectors, you're curious about people and you're curious about where we're going to go, um, you can you can do a lot of things, and if you get the key skills to be adaptable, and um, you'll be all right, uh, and you'll you'll make an impact. On the very important point of inequality in the entire process and the entire conversation of leadership, I completely agree, and it's incredibly important. And I think one of the biggest crimes that we live with today is inequality and the inequality of opportunities, and that is what a lot of these programs kind of perpetuate. But I think that goes back down to the conversation and the understanding of what leadership is in itself. Leadership should not be seen as an end, but it should be seen as a means to an end. And that, that should be seen as a leadership that takes society forward without, without anyone left behind, without a situation where you do not understand the language on the application forms, or you cannot pay for the fees to get into these, into these um, fancy elite leadership programs and everything. I, I completely agree. It is a problem that hopefully if we can reconstruct the understanding of what leadership is so that it is a means to an end, the leaders themselves can redevelop the system and the entire structures and stop the marginalization of people that just don't have the opportunities. Um, 
thank you so much for your great questions, um, for your great contributions. I think uh, we all hopefully sort of like at least had some seed planted um, that's going to grow and then we'll go on to do amazing things. The next thing that we're going to have is a presentation from the High Life Foundation. The High Life Foundation are sponsoring this uh, conference at some level quite generously, if I must say. Um, and there is a opportunity for us to not just think about this, etc., but then to actually do something about it um, and contribute to building African leaders as we also build our own African leadership. So I'll hand over to a representative from the High Life Foundation, Edward Muguza. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dalmozi. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dalmozi, for, for the presentation. Is it working? All right, sounds good. But uh, I'll continue to talk. Um, this has been a very interesting panel, uh, and uh, we definitely learned a lot in terms of building young African leaders. And as an organization, as High Life Foundation, I can proudly say we are right in the trenches of building young African leaders. Uh, High Life Foundation was founded in 1996 uh, by Dr. Striver and Tima Siwa, and our work focuses on uh, equipping young leaders uh, through education. Uh, over the last 20 years, uh, we have directly and indirectly impacted over 250,000 uh, students in Burundi, in Zimbabwe, and Lesotho. And we're also involved in other programs in terms of uh, university preparation across the continent. Uh, even though the work of the foundation has been massive and we're seeing a lot of transformative action on the ground, uh, we still have a lot of significant gaps uh, in terms of access, in terms of equity, and in terms of quality of education across the whole African continent. For example, 61 million primary school children uh, face a daunting reality that by the time they get to adolescence, they wouldn't be able to, to read and write, even though they are in school. What might be the problem uh, that we are facing that we have students that are in school uh, that are not actually learning? Uh, those are some of the questions that we actually face as a foundation, and we're thinking through innovative ways uh, of actually having an impact and making sure that the students that are in school are actually learning and developing the skills that they need. As a foundation, uh, we are undergoing a restructuring exercise, more like uh, a redefining our strategy to make sure that we have the most impact in terms of our investment. Uh, currently, the work that we are doing uh, spans across three different buckets. So the first bucket is access to education, making sure that all the students that, that need the support that they need to go to school uh, are actually in school. The second bucket we're working in is around improving the quality of education. Uh, we have worked, I think Ms. Tanya Masiwa mentioned that uh, we have developed a, an online smart learning platform called Zero. Uh, so students from everywhere across for, for now we're focused in Zimbabwe, so across the continent later on, can actually log in and actually then starting from primary school, secondary school, uh, and then like, you know, the other, 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 other modules we're going to add on. So that's the area that we're working around, like quality of education. Uh, the third bucket of interest that we're working in is around long life development. Making sure that like, you know, even though students might go through primary school and secondary school and go to tertiary, even though, uh, they are still part and parcel of our program, they still continue to learn and actually engage within their communities further. Uh, coincidentally, the three areas that we work in, uh, they are actually uh, part of the SDG number four, if we know from, from the recently announced Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which focus on uh, increasing access to quality education and also promoting lifelong learning. Uh, so that's the work we are doing as a foundation. Uh, but the, the main area that I want to focus on today, uh, that is around like, you know, uh, building young African leaders around mentorship, which is the third bucket of lifelong development. Uh, we believe that the students that we have in our platform, uh, they need the, the life skills, they need the competencies uh, to make sure that they, they, they can actually engage their communities and have the impact that they want to see. 
the work that we've been doing, uh, we have seen a lot of impact. However, we believe that that impact can be amplified if our students uh, have global exposure. We're thinking about our way of the foundation, even though it's in local communities, uh, with the students working across uh, the students across the different platform, across uh, different communities and districts. Uh, these students, we want them to engage at a global level. So the work that I'm going to talk about today is our partnership with the Oxford University, Africa Society. Uh, we have a video that we're going to show, uh, and I'll let uh, my colleagues uh, that are in this video that are right in Zimbabwe, and also the students uh, that are in Zimbabwe, speak to you and actually inform you about the work that we are doing. Uh, and I'll also have my colleague from our Oxford Africa Society go into detail in terms of like, what is that partnership and how is mentorship important uh, in terms of building young African leaders. My name is Ilani Matanda from High Life Foundation. I'm the Lifelong Development Manager. And in Lifelong Development, we're looking at raising champions, young people who are innovators, young people who bring solutions to the current 21st century challenges that the world is facing. In High Life Foundation, we believe in young people. We believe that young people are the future the future that we wish to see, the future that we want to see. And every Saturday for the past two years, we've been meeting with a group of young people on a Saturday afternoon, online, training, mentoring, coaching these young people to become the leader that we'd like to see. Currently, we are increasing our scope of mentorship because we believe that in mentorship, you raise a generation of leaders. You take one person to raise another person. A person who has more information, more knowledge, more skill, to be able to take one who is asking questions, looking at their purpose in life. And we believe that mentorship can do that, can provide the guidance, can provide the coaching, the training that we require to see developing the kind of 21st century leader that we want to see. As we launch this scope, we are collaborating with Oxford uh, Africa Student Society to provide the mentors that we want to see developing these young people. We believe that you as an Oxford student can provide the leadership, the guidance. You can train a young person to become a global leader. And through this initiator, we together can raise a generation of leaders who can transform the nation. The Highlight Foundation Training and Shield Life has been helpful on social levels from personal, spiritual levels, to growth levels, to economic levels. Um, I basically learned that I am. And because I am, I can be something in the world. I can make an impact in the world. I learned that I can say, I learned that I can make the most of where I come from, no matter how I can. So it has taught me to be a better person than I would never thought I would be. From my lesson, I learned uh, how to lead other people. I've learned how to advise other young people of my age. I've also learned uh, how to live my life uh, despite having some, uh, despite having uh, many uh, uh, disadvantages uh, in environment or despite having scarce resources in the way I live. Mentorship programs are mind opening to me because you're not only focused on achieving one thing but then your mind is open to know that you can make it in life using different groups and learning from people who have actually done it and people who have actually been through the same road that you are. So uh, for me, mentorship is very important and I highly recommend it. As Highlight Foundation today, we've reached over 200,000 young people with similar skills, uh, with access to school, with quality education, and with a kind of mentorship that allows them to remain in school and accomplish school. On a weekly basis, we are meeting up to 700 young people, 600 young people, and imparting their skills upon their lives. We commit to reaching out to more young people. Not only are we in Zimbabwe, but we're in Burundi, we're in Lesotho, we're in Swazi. We have young people listening in from the United States of America. And we commit to ensure that these young people listening commit to follow a mentor systematically and 
receive the kind of skills that they need to become the leaders that we want to see to, to, for them to see. I want to thank the organizer, uh, Anna the Ayala Foundation team. I want also to thank uh, uh, everyone for the support they're giving us. I would love to thank Ayala Foundation for the opportunity they've given us to see that we are worth more, worth more than we can get. So you guys are going to be mentors? Hmm? You should be mentors in the program. Uh, so this year, as part of our initiatives towards making youth leadership the core of what we're doing with this conference, we partnered with the High Life Foundation to form a peer mentorship group. Now, we were speaking a lot about the bridge between generations, and, and that's a bridge that often can, be, can, 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 can really be crossed if, 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 if people are being mentored and people are being sponsored in their development. Um, but at the center of youth leadership as well is this idea that we can also learn from each other. This idea that we can also share ideas and exchange ideas and, and share our own experiences and also, I think, broaden other people's view of what it is they can accomplish when they're young. And so that's what we're doing with the High Life Foundation this year. We're trying to set up a mentorship program that every single Saturday we have different students from Oxford get on a platform called Young and Dynamic and they speak to other students, so hundreds of people that are tuning in. We have questions that are being thrown in live and we make sure that there's a lot of interaction between the students through that through that platform and so that's what we started to do over the last couple of weeks and it's been a really great opportunity for people to explore issues such as how do I make the decision to get into postgraduate study is it now or is it later or talking about social enterprises and how it is that they can access funding building databases for people to know the resources that are available to them so sharing resources and sharing ideas because I think peer mentorship is a huge part of, of youth leadership and so that's what we're doing and so this really is an invitation um, as we're talking about building young African leaders, there are these programs and there's a lot of people that can mentor us that are older than us and more experienced, but how about you also tap into the network of other young people that are doing really amazing things and that have access to resources and knowledge that you may not. That's what we're trying to create with High Life Foundation. And so over lunch, we're going to have a computer set up by the registration table. And if you're interested in joining this network of peer mentors and joining us for one Saturday, maybe two, if you have a lot of ideas to share. And getting involved in this platform yeah. and being a peer mentor for, for, for young Africans that are living on the continent and also learning from those interactions through the questions that they ask, through the, through the pushback that you'll get in those conversations, um, please sign up. So just give us your email and you'll have um, access to a link to sign up after the conference. Um, but yes, it's an invitation for you to also engage in building young African leaders. Great. Thank you, Rutendo, for, for, for that. As what she said, like, you know, we are in the business of uh, building young leaders, and we need your advice. Uh, just to get you excited, on the Higher Life Foundation program right now, we have around 20,000 students that we are supporting uh, across the different countries we're operating. And by 2020, uh, we are aiming to impact over 2 million leaders uh, across the sub-Saharan Africa. So those 2 million leaders who need people that will actually guide them, that will coach them and provide them the support. So your mentorship uh, is definitely essential. So we'd like to get you involved, and uh, today is the day for you to get signed up, uh, and we're launching this program today. Thank you so much. Um, so it's lunchtime now, um, and we'll resume the program after that. And so for all the delegates, um, please make your way uh, outside, and there will be lunch. Uh, for the speakers, um, please follow the volunteers up to the Morris Room for your lunch break as well. Um, but feel free to come out and, and network with the delegates after that. Yeah. Um, thank you.